And I think the conversation steered into um, territories, I think, which Leslie will be able to pick up on. Um, uh, Leslie Locko, who is our next uh, speaker. Um, Leslie is uh, the founder and director of the African Futures Institute, um, situated in, Af in Accra and Ghana, um, after having been building up and running really exciting architecture schools in South Africa and also in the US um, and in uh, Britain before. And um, now uh, also she has been appointed the new curator for the next architectural biennale in Venice. So we are very happy to have you here. Leslie. Thank you very much. Um, I've been practicing this all day to say your eminences. <laughs> so um, it's a great pleasure to be here in Rome. And I can say um, categorically that it's not often I share the stage with um, quantum physicists and mathematicians. So thank you very much for the, the invitation and the honor. Um, I, can I start? No? I just moved the camera. I'm back. This one. There we go. Okay, so the title of my talk, The Popularity of Beauty, isn't actually my title. It was suggested to me, which has been quite an interesting way to put a talk together. Is it the title that I would have chosen? Not exactly mostly because in the context in which I have worked during my career, beauty is not popular. In my emails to the organizers, I described my speech in the following way. Beauty and design are often seen as the preserve of elite, off limits until the basic requirements of shelter, food, and security have been met. But imagination is both powerful and free and is usually the catalyst for change. If you cannot imagine a better future, it is difficult to argue its case. Which one? This one, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, great, okay. So over the past 30 years, it has been an almost constant source of surprise to me, certainly in the rather narrow academic communities in which I've worked, to find that most people who may never have heard of Maslow subconsciously defer to his hierarchy of needs. It is generally assumed that only those who've attained self-actualization have the means, right, and ambition to be creative. For the most part, critique of Maslow is structural. In other words, it's the hierarchy that is wrong, the way the levels are stacked one on top of each other, rather than the underlying assumption that creativity or the imagination are states to be attained, fought for, achieved, much like the language of development itself. But if there is one thing that I have learned in nearly 30 years of teaching architecture and writing fiction, it's this. People have to have a language to speak about where they are and what other possible futures are available to them. So how does one go about acquiring or enabling this language? what we found, an inventory of feminist upheaval. Was anarchy merely an expression of love and care? The methods of struggle are improvised in the soul, improvised in the air, improvised from nothing. The reformers and the journalists didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know that the hallway and stairwell were places of assembly, or that you love in doorways. Feminists are activists. The riot is like a general strike, a bridge between now and the free territory. 
the riot seeks to preserve nothing. The enclosure provides the field for heroic deeds. Musadi Utwarati Baka Bohai. Lempi, my Lanana, Matomas and Amangani, Azovan and Kinga, Efana Niam. They dream a new set of arrangements. They dream the end of involuntary servitude. What did she think of herself? Not much or quite a lot? Depending how you look at it. We are not what other people say we are. We are who we know ourselves to be. We are what we love. That's okay. What we stand on is not masonry. It is the torn place unhealed. Yila is Londa, Zingapoli corn. Yila is Londa, Zingapoli corn. I find it increasingly impossible to summarize my thoughts in the usual 20 minutes that you're allocated in events like this. The best a speaker can hope for, I think, is to leave the audience with a sense of having seen or heard something that makes them think in turn, reflect, and perhaps even remember. It is no secret that I am deep in the middle of planning and designing the most visible project I've ever undertaken, and ever likely to ever undertake again, the Biennale Architectura, which will open in Venice next year. As often happens when you're presented with an opportunity to think deeply about the issues that matter, the issues that you've been interested in that will hopefully last, I found myself going back to key moments where ideas suddenly crystallized, often unexpectedly. I've chosen four such moments which I'll talk about quickly today, and they are all connected to the idea of beauty, though in different ways. I've described these chronologically, but it is no by no means clear to me that the most illuminating ideas always come last. In 1995, whilst undertaking a part-time master's degree at the University of East London, I read Umberto Eco's Aesthetics and the Philosophy of Art badly and in a hurry. It was my first introduction to Eco as a bona fide intellectual, not just as the author of popular fiction. In hindsight, I realized that it was also my first introduction to the idea that creativity could be both populist and specialist, both highbrow and lowbrow, or perhaps more accurately, commercial as well as literary which I now come to understand as two completely ludicrous distinctions. In the first chapter, Echo describes how both Hamlet or Shakespeare and Socrates speak of art as a mirror held up to the nature. But where Socrates saw mirrors as reflecting what we can already see, Hamlet recognized that reflecting surfaces show us what we would otherwise not perceive. Children, let them come and sit at my feet, little Babaliseli Tom. I want to tell them magnificent tales of how their fathers were heroes, paint them a portrait of Isandra, and then take them to El Obeid and Sheikh Khan. I want to journey with them to the beautiful forgotten lands. My children need to know that we have our own epic story. So in bringing together this panel of speakers with their diverse disciplinary backgrounds, interests, and differing modes of practice, we were really interested in a range of disciplines that are somehow peripheral to architecture, like poetry, like psychology, like performance. Disciplines that are not really at the center of architecture, but have an enormous amount to contribute to it. So the idea of forgetting architecture came about because we wanted to forget the primary role of architecture and look to other disciplines. I would say that this kind of situation are very important for the students to understand how thinking differently is important to, to guide an alternative way of designing reality. So I would stress this kind of situation where, let's say, theoretical seminars and meet and corrections and dialogue on projects join together, just to let them feel that the thinking and doing is the same things. I still feel that we are living in a kind of a 
zero degree age where all the things are not clear and uh, the burden will be clear probably in two generations. So we are entering a completely new phase, mm -hmm. which is not at the zero degree of modernists. Mm -hmm. We are not heroes anymore. We are just cleaning the soil to prepare the next seeding for the next generation. I was able to post a few uh, of the videos that uh, people had posted on Instagram. And I received a text message at about midnight from my daughter. And uh, she said, Dad, this is scary. I said, you know, it's not as scary as the world we're living in. <laughs> and she said, but how did it feel? What were people's reaction? I said, it was very comfortable for me inside. And I think it, it may have been unsettling for people outside. You know, and in that moment, I knew that I had created a space for me. All of that is an effort for me to figure out another way to remember. Conversations like the ones that took place at Forgetting Architecture, I think are a very powerful way of remembering that education is far more than the list of learning outcomes prescribed in any given degree. It's also the unexpected encounters, knowledge and discussions that happen when talented students and critical thinkers come together. And that's how we expand our understanding of the fields in which we're engaged. That's how knowledge is produced. How many of us will say, of course I saw the, the plane goes into the tower. No, you didn't, because no one filmed the, 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 the tower. But, but our, our national memory, it's, it's embedded so deeply within our, our memories. I am now carrying a sense of responsibility to continue this kind of work beyond where it is now. And I think it's really important that in the next phase of the GSA, we start to develop a criticality and a sense of reflection about what the project we're doing here is and how we take that forward. By and large, architectural education, at least insofar as I've experienced it, particularly as a teacher, teaches us how to see what we already know. The technical command of representation, how to draw plans, sections, elevations, details, is a quantifiable skill that can be measured and assessed. In almost every report by external examiners over the past 50 years at schools of architecture all over the globe, there will be some comment about the student's poor grasp of technology. Far more useful, in my humble opinion, would be a comment about the poor grasp of imagination. Perhaps imagination being harder to quantify and objectively assess is considered too risky. Or perhaps, as was once pointed out to me in a conversation about architectural education in South Africa, there is no point teaching black students to dream. They need jobs. They need skills. I disagree. In 2014, at a restaurant in Bramfontein, Johannesburg, I asked a young black architect what had turned him onto architecture as a possible profession. I grew up in the Cape Flats, he said, without a tree in sight, with nothing but concrete all around us. I had my fifth birthday party in the garage of our house, not the garden. There wasn't one. That's what all the kids around me did. We had our birthday parties in garages. I used to look at the city on the slopes of Table Mountain, look at those leafy suburbs and think, I want to live there. I want to live like that. Those leafy suburbs, that's what got me. Now I live in Melville. It's leafy, real leafy. If you ask me what made me choose architecture, it was beauty, just wanting to live in a beautiful place. Yeah, beauty, or maybe the lack of it, you know? One of the most common and interesting conversations I have at home in Accra has to do with novelty, more specifically the idea that newness equals beauty, aspiration, development, modernity. 
that to be new is better than being old, not just young, but new. This assumption, certainly in the post-colonial world, fuels another deeper insecurity, which has to do with the relationship between culture and tradition. Broadly speaking, tradition refers to the transmission of information, beliefs, customs, rituals, values, and so on, from one generation to another. By definition, its lifespan is long. The root of the word tradition is interesting, and in Latin, tradere means two things, to deliver and to betray. This is um, one of the silos that was built by Kwame Nkrumah. This is a building from the 60s, which is lost in time. And then we are trying to excavate it in order to be able to produce new futures. We are trying to open up the discourse in terms of art. How do we go back to like this, the idea of the ground zero, the bottom line, in order to be able to find new forms of inspiration that somehow includes everyone? So with tradition is indeed to betray culture's inherent capacity, which is to translate the world around us in all its complexity into something that gives us clarity, understanding, meaning, and hopefully hope. The African Futures Institute is a public events platform, research center, and eventual postgraduate school of architecture that I founded in 2021, with support from the Ford Foundation and Mellon Foundation. It is now almost exactly a year old. It began as a series of what if questions. What if a new school of architecture suddenly emerged from a new and unexpected place? What if Africa held the key to overcoming so many contemporary challenges of race, environmental justice, new forms of urbanism? What if a new African school could teach the global north how to embed diversity, equity, and inclusion at the heart of all built environment pedagogy, not at its edges? What if a constellation of progressive global voices could find the space and freedom to produce and transform a truly transformative agenda? I've always used uh, architectural softwares simply to the extent of how can I exploit them for an idea or concept. days, of course, too early to tell if we will ever answer those questions, let alone fulfill the ambition. But as Daniel Burnham said famously, make no small plan. In the short while that we've been operational, I know we have managed to do one thing, which is make imagination, beauty, and optimism in architecture freely available to our growing audience, whose appetite and enthusiasm for authentic voices is both astonishing and undiminished. I've all... For the most part, all these systems have been done from a place of making do or kind of getting by. And what do you do when you are given the space of abundance to design from a territory of you can rather than making do? Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, Comments and questions for the audience. Sorry. Hey. Just absorbing that more broadly, but the thing I wanted to kind of just comment on is the relationship between uh, invention and how that the invention of, of, of creativity as a, as a professional class and how that has been critiqued as a as a a form of professionalization which enhances and accelerates the kind of capitalist structures that we've been talking a bit about today. Um, I'm curious as to 
There's a book that I'm thinking of. I cannot remember the author name. I apologize, but it's called Against Creativity. Um, and I'm in, interested not from a perspective of critiquing what you're talking about here, but rather uh, where where that fits into if, if that that line of thinking um, comes through some of the dialogue that you that's emerging from, say, the African Futures Institute and things like that, the professionalism of um, and precarity of, of creativity in that context. I mean, I, I suppose I would answer it primarily by saying that um, if you were to ask me after 30 years of teaching, what is it that African and black students lack? I would say it's confidence. And the confidence to be creative and critical is absolutely essential. I think I said in the beginning, if you cannot imagine another future, you will never design it. You, you can't even argue for its case. So in a very um, elemental way, I think what this pedagogy does is teaches students to have the confidence to speak from their own positions. I don't say that that's forever. I think being angry is the first step. I think you have to move beyond that. But you cannot move beyond it if you don't have the confidence to voice your anger. Yeah. Thank you very much for this amazing presentation. It took me a long time to figure out how I was going to appropriate it. And your comment just now helped me do that. You know, we are all talking about our, you know, our colonial heritage that belittles what we know, that reduces young people's ability to think that whatever they think is right and what your colonial education taught you was wrong. And in some ways, I, I see a lot of what you're doing fundamentally also addressing those things. Because, uh, you know, all over Asia and Africa, uh, your northern, you know, most of the brilliant minds in our own countries go to the north. You get completely uh, uh, into the imagination that comes from there then you come back and then you reproduce it. And so I think that uh, in many ways, what you have shown uh, underlines the need to defy that, but not in a negative way, but to the production of a, a, a new, uh, deeply, understandingly, alternate ways of looking at what we consider as beautiful, as relevant, and as important. So thank you very much. I would say um, at a very fundamental level, all architecture is about translation, about the translation of an idea into a drawing, a drawing into a model, a model into a building, and so on. There's this constant shift of meaning. And I don't think there is a single, let me only speak about Africa, but I don't think there's a single African alive who doesn't speak more than one language. And so there's something in that ability to continuously and constantly translate that makes this a really rich discipline. But it's not rich in the way that we currently teach it. What I found we have to do is to un almost undo the teaching in order to reach that innate um, instinct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for that. You started... Um your presentation saying that people have to have a language you know, to describe where they are and, and, and what is available to them. And in your experience, I'm wondering how that language has somehow evolved, of what, what, have, you, what have you seen um, that is perhaps um, not reflected in, in in what we're doing here today? And what type of messages perhaps that we're missing as we are developing a charter, as we're here discussing questions of, you know, for the world? Um, I have a feeling that we may be missing clues about um, a certain language, a certain uh, message that we need to integrate to be able to accomodate the majority of us. 
I don't know yet what it is. So I'm, I'm just thinking of, of what have you seen in your experience in those decades that you've mentioned that we need to take into account, perhaps? I, great question. It's a great question, and I think the most honest way I can answer that is to say that the school, we've been talking quite a lot about education, and I see the school as, as a very broad term. But if we cannot protect the space in which we feel safe enough to ask those kinds of questions, I suspect in 50 years' time, we will be talking about the same thing. And that is not to say that I don't think there are some answers to that question. I think the question of love, the question of imagination, the question of safety, the question of self-actualization, uh, I think these are really important uh, aspects. But we tend to teach, and I can only speak about architectural education, we tend to speak as if those were either universal and given, and that we all, in one sense, speak the same language. And I think what's been really interesting listening to the, you know, the presentations today is it's super clear that there are multiple ways of understanding the world. There are multiple languages. If the school is not the place in which we can develop the ability to translate, to hold those multiple languages safely together, I, I suspect we will always be talking about this. Leslie, thank you very much.